Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. Hurricanes, suspicious fires, firearms going off accidentally. Those were among the stories from the National Park System last week that we covered on National Parks Traveler. We also followed the announcement of a new CEO for the troubled Yellowstone Forever organization and discussed whether national parks could slow the sixth mass extinction. You can find those and other stories about national parks and protected areas at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, we look back at the top news stories from the park system in July. There was passage of the Great American Outdoors Act by Congress, the ongoing issue of the coronavirus pandemic, and how parks have been dealing with it, and news that the renowned Sea Turtle Science and Recovery Program at Padre Island National Seashore is to be greatly scaled back. Joining me to look back at July's news impacting national parks is Mike Murray, a member of the Executive Council of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. July was quite the month for National Park News, and not just because Congress passed the Great American Outdoors Act. That, of course, was the biggest story for the month, as it lines up $6.5 billion for the National Park Service to use in tackling its maintenance backlog. But there were other stories in the parks as well, and discussed last month's news from the park system. We're joined by Mike Murray from the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. Welcome to The Traveler, Mike. Thank you, Kurt. Happy to be with you today. Appreciate that. Let's start with the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, How significant will you say this act is? I would say it's huge in capital letters. If if I was doing a tweet, it would be capital H-U-G-E. And the reason I say that is it's been a longstanding concern of many supporters and supporters of the Land and Water Conservation Fund that uh, even though there's royalties from offshore oil and gas uh, drilling coming into the fund uh, year after year after year, Congress has often been reluctant to allow the use of the fund for the intended purpose, which mm-hmm. is, again, conservation use. Um, I, I've done quite a bit of reading about the fund and its origins. In my view, it's one of those landmark conservation laws from the 1960s that was incredibly visionary uh, is based on a fairly simple idea that the federal government controls offshore oil and gas drilling in the outer continental shelf, which is an exploitation of resources owned by all Americans. And so the idea behind the Land and Water Conservation Fund was to dedicate a portion of those offshore royalties to conserving land and waters elsewhere in the country. So if if we're gonna do uh, inevitable extraction of resources, there's always gonna be some level of impact from that. Uh, The intent was to do some good elsewhere with the fund. And it's done an incredible amount of good over the years. But again, in the last 10 or 20 years, it's been rare that Congress has allowed full use of the funds. Yeah, Two things have happened. Uh, let me just add one more thing. Two things have happened. One, uh, the fund has never been full, um, 
permanently authorized. It's always been at sunset term limits on it. And March of 2019, Congress finally made it a permanent authorization, which is really important. That was kind of step one. And then the next step is to authorize the use of the money. It's a two-phase process. So that's what the Great American Outdoors Act has done recently. It uh, allows the full $900 million to be used, and it also has provided $6.5 billion, sorry, billion, right. $6.5 billion to help the Park Service deal with its deferred maintenance backlog. Yeah. Now, you mentioned you know where the Land and Water Conservation Fund gets its money um, from energy development, extraction, whether it's on land or offshore. Um, somebody was commenting just the other day on the Traveler that that's the problem with the bill, is that it encourages basically energy development to provide the revenues for the bill. Is there an issue with that? You know, it's an interesting thought. It's a, a bit of a chicken or chicken and or the egg dilemma, I would say. It's hard to say how much impact that has. You know, the reality is there's probably no end in sight to offshore oil and gas uh, drilling and use in the foreseeable future, you know, depending on which parties in the White House are in control of Congress, there may be a greater push toward conservation measures and reduced carbon emissions and those kinds of things. But I, th- I think the reality is as long as the country is dependent on oil and gas, there's going to be drilling in the federal estate mm-hmm. onshore and also offshore. So again, going back to the intent from the 1964 Act, the intent was as long as that depletion of natural resources is occurring, then some of the royalties would go toward conservation of other resources, yeah. including land and water. Yeah. Now, I was talking with an economist from uh, Resources for the Future, um, a non, nonpartisan um, think tank, if you will, back in D.C., and she was telling me that, you know, the $6.5 billion is, is really a Band-Aid approach to tackling the maintenance backlog, and certainly the the backlog is about $12 billion. Um, $6.5 billion is to be doled out over five years. And at the same time, the maintenance backlog has been growing, I believe, anywhere is between $300 million and six or $700 million a year. Any any um, merit to that um, concern, that it's just, just not enough well, to really I, tackle the... Um, it- here, here's the way I look at it, and I've been following this issue for a long time, including when I worked for the Park Service, particularly in management type positions, uh, where you know I had some responsibility over facility management, but dealing with the backlog and competing for funding for major repair rehab projects and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. It's a fact that the Park Service current estimate is twelve billion dollars, so six. $0.5 billion doesn't take care of it all, but it's a huge step in the right direction. That's $6.5 billion to be dispersed over a five-year period. Can't do the math exactly in my head right away, but that's over a billion a year. Yeah, and 1.3. The, the, the reality is the Park Service could not spend $12 billion in five years or Six billion dollars in a year, or those kinds of things. It takes time to complete planning for projects, and there is a whole list of projects that have most of the planning done and are ready to go. Right. But then to get them contracted out and those kinds of things. So I, I see it as a huge step in the right direction. It's not the complete solution, but it, you know we can at least rely on that funding for the next five years, mm-hmm. and that'll make a lot of progress and do a lot of good, but it won't solve the problem entirely. Yeah, I guess I guess the other component that she was pointing out was that we need to basically give the Park Service more money in an annual basis in their operations budget to do more and more of the maintenance backlog. And I don't think we'll ever see a day when the, the backlog is down to zero, but you know, get it down to a more manageable level probably would be a good thing. Here, I, I I agree with you and um and, and her statement on that. An observation I had back in the 1990s, and I've 
never changed my mind on it. It continues to seem to be the case is all the attention is given to the major deferred maintenance backlog, the really expensive stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, there's little focus on what I believe are the root causes of that, which is chronic underfunding of routine and preventive maintenance. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, think of your personal car. If you, you were eligible, if you had a contingency fund put in a trustee account, and you can only use that when the engine of your car fails, but you're competing with all your cousins and nephews for that same piece of money when their car fails, but you don't have money to change the oil regularly. You don't have money to fix the brakes when they need it. Your only, your primary option is to drive the car until it fails, mm -hmm. until the engine fails, and then you're eligible to compete for that, you know, special funds to do a major replacement. That's the equivalent of what's going on at the park level. You know, the dilemma I faced as a deputy superintendent or superintendent often was we can barely keep the restrooms clean and, you know, all the systems running. We don't have enough staff to get out there and do preventive maintenance um, on HVAC systems, on buildings, which, you know, includes things like keeping the roof in good condition before it starts to leak because a leaky roof has caused more damage, et cetera. So in, in my view, any large deferred maintenance project that gets funding in the next few years, it'll be fixed for a while, but it'll start the process over again that over the next 10 or 20 years, the same facilities will have inadequate maintenance and they will start to deteriorate again. But it, it's a challenge to, um, I think, convince Congress and others that additional funds would actually save money in the long run instead of doing these really expensive major repairs on facilities, uh, which, you know, add up to a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, if more money was invested in taking care of facilities when they are in good shape, then it would save money in the long run. But that's hard to prove on paper, and it's hard to convince somebody because, again, that would require more operational funds, and that seems to be a, a non-starter these days. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wonder, um, also in June, um, there were a couple of maintenance-related stories that, that cropped up. One was the, um, the uh, road overpass at Old Faithful. Um, the park shut it down because they were doing some theoretically routine maintenance, and they, they noticed some structural issues that they weren't sure how safe the overpass was, and so they shut that down. And on the very day that the Great American Outdoors Act passed Congress, Grand Canyon National Park put into place water conservation measures because of problems with the Trans Canyon Pipeline. Both those items, the, the overpass at Old Faithful and the Grand Canyon Trans Canyon Pipeline, date back to the 1960s. And I'm just wondering if anybody has taken a look at major infrastructure projects that were part of the um, Mission 66 improvements across the park system, what type of shape they're in. Are, are um, the uh, overpass at Old Faithful and the Trans Canyon Pipeline outliers out there, or are they um, just the beginning of uh, similar problems we're, we're going to see elsewhere in the national parks? I think it's just the tip. My own experience and observation is what those two examples are just the tip of the iceberg. If you think about it, most most of those, um, the Mission 66 period was kind of the mid-50s to the mid-60s, 10-year mm -hmm. period of infusion of funds to build new facilities. I've lived and worked in a number of Mission 66 facilities, housing, office buildings, et cetera. But if you think about it, those places now are, what, 50-plus years old? And buildings don't last forever, particularly if there's not adequate routine maintenance, preventive maintenance, as well as cyclic maintenance. Buildings you know, need to be painted mm -hmm. every so often. My, my experience working in coastal parks, because of the harsh environment there, most wood structures need to be painted every five years. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have 
the crews on hand or the funding to do that, then maybe they get painted every 10 years, but you're going to experience some deterioration of the, you know, external envelope of the building over that time. So, you know, I, I don't know that there's ever been a complete assessment of just Mission 66 structures as to what their maintenance needs are, but probably somewhere in within the Park Service uh, database. And they have this massive database of all their facility assets and their maintenance needs. That information can be ferreted out. Um, yeah. I, I think in general, I would just view those, they're fairly old buildings. Uh, some places they're viewed as historic and some they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a very sort of basic modern design. So people looked at, let's say the visitor center at Wright Brothers National Memorial, which is a national historic landmark, believe it or not, but it looks like some people call it the Pizza Hut BC. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's sort of a, a Jetson, you know, here come the Jetsons type kinda of like, modern. Kind of like the spaceship that was the, um, the visitor center at Paradise in Mount Rainier. Yeah. But, you know, historically it's old, it's old enough to qualify as historic. It's, unique there's you know interesting story about the architectural design and who did it and all those kinds of things so i guess my observation is many of the um, mission 66 buildings are relatively plain and unremarkable compared to the civilian conservation corps era buildings the visitor centers the mm -hmm. big stone and massive timber bridges in yellowstone or wherever which, you know, clearly are much older, but um, in, in any event, old buildings in mean, 50 years is an old building, in my view, particularly when it's primarily made out of wood, many of them, or it's old enough to be a concern. But those kind of buildings need regular maintenance, painting, roof replacement, HVAC, Maintenance and upgrades, you know, you name it, improved um, um, insulation. So um, many of those buildings, I think, are going to be susceptible to the same kinds of uh, dramatic failures that you're hearing about with the uh, Trans Canyon pipeline and the overpass at Old Faithful. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, um, it's uh, early August and uh, late July. Um, coronavirus continues to be an issue across the national park system. We're seeing more and more access open to visitors in the parks. Um, but is that a good thing? After all, Big Ben closed down again because of uh, employees coming down with uh, COVID-19. And there have been news reports that Yosemite National Park must have more than a few cases based on analysis of sewage coming from the Yosemite Valley. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Are the parks opening up too quickly? You know, it's hard to say. Um, if you look at the national picture, not just parks, areas that have opened more aggressively than others are experiencing a resurgence in the number of new cases. You know, Major League Baseball, hmm. two teams <laughs> have players that tested positive and, you know, they have a lot of financial resources that if, if they get it, then it's inevitable that park staff are going to get it or let local community visitor service providers, some of their staff are going to get it. To me, it's very disappointing and it's a concern that we've had at the coalition regarding the lack of information and transparency on the part of the park service. Mm -hmm. There are, are undoubtedly cases among park service employees that the public doesn't know about. But I can't put a number on it because the Park Service doesn't talk about it very much. So you only hear about cases like, um, I believe it was Big Bend, right, that yeah. closed recently. Yeah, although there was a news uh, the other day um, up at Katmai National Park and Preserve in Alaska that um, they've uh, closed Brooks Camp um, down because of um, some positive COVID cases there, I believe, among the uh, residential park staff at Brooks Camp. Again, the, the report out of Yosemite that there must be some cases there. 
Interestingly, Yellowstone National Park, they've been testing and testing and testing. And there was a uh, press release from the park just the other day that I think they've tested a thousand or more than a thousand primarily park service staff as well as some concession staff. And I think they've identified three positive cases and two of those were among concession workers. So obviously there's there's a way to manage this and it's it's probably not a um, a cookie cutter thing that can be replicated at every park across the country. Right. And I, I would like to commend Yellowstone and the program they have of proactive testing uh, and being transparent about it with mm-hmm. the public. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, it shows that whatever they're doing is pretty darn effective. But so many other parks, you just don't know. You can imagine people traveling from all over the country to visit many of these units of the national park system this time of year. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's a scary thought. Uh, I assume if there was any uh, major outbreak somewhere, it'd probably make it into the news. But um, in the sake of transparency, I will say that the coalition uh, has was a critic of the Park Service back in March, that they weren't closing when they should. Uh, we've been submitted, submitting monthly FOIA requests asking for the number of cases of uh, park employees that have tested positive, and the park has never responded other than to acknowledge they received it and say, your request is in the processing queue. Uh, one month, our request was number seven, 117, and <laughs> in the line, the next month, it was number 114, which in my interpretation means they processed three client, or FOIA requests that month. Yeah. So anyway, they're not forthcoming. Which is a concern in my mind because, again, comparing to Yellowstone, if they're testing, if they know who has it and how many have it, then it increases public confidence that they're on top of it, that they know what they're doing, that their plan is effective. But when there is no information forthcoming and they don't tell the public if any local employees have it, then, you know, it's hard to know. It's hard to have that confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking today with uh, Mike Murray, who's uh, with the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks, uh, discussing some of the news stories that cropped up across the national park system in July. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, a training center, a conference center, and a leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences that it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at BRPFoundation.org. We're back now with Mike Murray from the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. Uh, Mike, one other side story, if you will, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Reservations to national parks. Rocky Mountain and Yosemite both are using reservation systems to manage people coming into the parks. Um, Zion National Park is doing the same thing to a certain degree. Um, Because if you want to go into Zion Canyon, you have to ride the shuttle. And to ride the shuttle, you need to get a ticket. 
Um, and I believe they're using a, a reservation system to distribute those tickets. At the same time, Glacier National Park has decided not to go in that direction for access to the going to the Sun Road. Any thoughts on that? Are, are reservations a good thing or a bad thing or hard to say? I think it's one of the tools in the toolbox, and I, I would uh, put my confidence in the local superintendents working with their local communities to figure out whether that's a good option for their particular situation. You know, on a simplistic level, I live in mid-coast Maine. Many of the stores here still have one-in, one-out policies. There's mm -hmm. some sort of carrying capacity to ensure reasonable social distancing. And once they reach that capacity, they don't let more in. So having a reservation system, certainly for visitors traveling from away, from out of state or whatever, I think that's helpful to them as long as it's getting the job done in terms of you know, protecting park employees, protecting local community service providers, you know, by keeping a manageable number of people congregated in any one place. So I, I can't really comment specifically on whether it's the right or the wrong decision for going to the Sun Highway versus Rocky Mountain National Park or, or Zion. Um, I've visited those places and, you know, can imagine it's challenging to, to sort of ensure People are wearing their mask reasonably and social distancing reasonably mm -hmm. in a park setting. So, yeah. uh, you know, I have to defer to the judgment of the superintendents, again, working with their local partners to figure out what's best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, um, overcrowding has been an issue at some parks since the Park Service Centennial back in 2016, um, when Americans largely seem to re rediscover their parks in mass, and uh, the traffic has been uh, incredible in, in many places, uh, particularly um, Zion National Park has had crowding issues. Yellowstone has had crowding issues in places. Yosemite Valley, um, not exactly a park setting if you've been there in the middle of August with um, thousands of others. The south rim of Grand Canyon National Park has had crowding issues. Do you think that um, through this reservation approach during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, once, once that's no longer an issue, that the Park Service perhaps should consider using reservations on a more permanent basis to, to try and manage crowds to, to take the, um, the pressure off both the resources, the natural resources, as well as the staff resources? I think it's definitely a useful test case or, you know, testing sort of the concept, uh, proof of concept kind of test. Um, it's been a long standing challenge at many parks. I worked at Yellowstone in the 90s. Uh, one of the things I worked on was the winter use plan, the snowmobile mm. <laughs> plan that, is, you know, was under litigation for 20 years afterwards. Two out of the last four summers, I've volunteered at the Ranger Museum in Yellowstone for a couple of weeks in the middle of the summer. Mm -hmm. Two out of the last four summers, I've visited with my family, Zion, in July or early August. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> well, that, that's what I said to myself. While waiting in line to get on a shuttle to go to a very busy trail. But then, you know, it's like this is when we could come. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to hike Angel's Landing or the Narrows or, you know, whatever. And then, you know, I just had to put myself in everybody else's shoes you know, on the crowded shuttle was, you know, this is when they could come. So, and everybody. So it, part of me was judging the experience of, you know, this is crowded. This doesn't feel good to me. But, you know, am I a Park Service snob elitist? <laughs> And, but I had to view it from the visitor point of view as well, because I was a visitor, too. It's kind of like, well, this is when I could come, and that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, the Park Service has been very reluctant for decades, probably to the, the detriment of park resources in the long run, to put firm numbers on how many people can use or come into the park. I think reservation certainly helps. There's some examples, such as hiking the cable trail 
on Half Dome. Mm-hmm. Used to be no limits on that. Now you have to have a reservation. It's hard to get a reservation, and you know things like that. Managing certain specific sites, it's going to take some kind of major change in philosophy. I think for the Park Service to assertively apply reservation requirements to just coming in the entrance. And it, but this is a good opportunity to test the concept and see how it works, and I'm sure those parks will learn something from it, and maybe they'll figure out applications later. Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, Acadia National Park has uh, come through with its uh, traffic management plan, if you will, um, that will require reservations to get into uh, the Park Loop Road um, during the peak seasons. Um, Arches National Park, I thought, had a very similar plan that uh, interior officials refused to let the Park Service move forward to. I wonder if that's just a a measure of uh, the political clout between uh, Utah and Maine when it comes to deciding what's a good system for managing people and resources or, or, or not. I don't know. I don't know that much specifically about those cases. I have kind of a long-term observation, and hopefully it won't get into too much of a war story, but the Park Service, Park Superintendents at places like Acadia, Zion, and, you know, their colleagues of mine, I know Jock Whitworth and Sheridan Steele and people that all push their shuttle systems. In general, the Park Service for the last 20-plus years has been to improve the efficiency of getting more people into the park during peak season. And that's politically just more palatable, you know, satellite parking, shuttle systems, it's not enough room for everybody to park their personal car up on Cadillac Mountain anymore during the summer. So park here and catch the shuttle, you know, those kinds of people mover <laughs> solutions allow more people or at least maintain the numbers without mm-hmm actually ever trying to limit the numbers. When I was on the team working on the Yellowstone snowmobile plan back in the 90s, we had people come in like transportation planners and their early versions in the park service. Uh, There's one called VERP, V-E-R-P, Visitor Experience Resource Protection, which is a carrying capacity kind of thing. Um, what I do recall is we had an engineer from Disney Corporation come, hmm. and they, you know, their job title is Imagineer, not Engineer, Imagineer. But hmm. uh, what <laughs> he was explaining the Disney World philosophy to us, and he basically explained that they manage the flow of people, and they keep customers happy by sort of managing their expectations. So um, the way they put it in words was, if you under-promise and over-deliver, people will be okay with crowdedness or waiting. So under-promise, over-deliver. So when you're in line at any other big rides at Disney, the little sign says, 45-minute wait from here. Mm-hmm. They've measured it. And they know it's a 30-minute wait. So you get up there, and it's 15 minutes sooner than you expected. You're mm-hmm. actually pretty happy about it, even though you just waited in line 30 minutes. Yeah. Now, that's not kind of the uh, customer or visitor manipulation the Park Service would ever do, I hope. But it, it just it played into the whole idea of, let's figure out how to get people in more efficiently, and then we can accommodate more. And the result is what we have today. You know, it doesn't solve the problem. It just makes it harder to solve. It puts it off for the future. And, I, you know, I don't know what the solution is, but the idea that we can keep getting more efficiency, more shuttles, more satellite parking, and, and cram more people into the same space doesn't fly anymore. Yeah, yeah. And now, of course, um, national parks are seen as incredible recreational outlets and um, kind of reinvigorate yourself after a six-month uh, stint at the office. It's nice to get out into the fresh air and, and see beautiful sceneries and whatnot. Um, many people might overlook the fact that the Park Service does an incredible amount of science 
earth sciences and, and biological sciences across uh, the park system. In July, a story cropped up from Padre Island National Seashore in Texas, where the superintendent there is saying that too much money is being spent on sea turtle research. And of course, um, for decades, Padre Island has been the, the leader, if you will, in science tied to the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, which is the most endangered of the five species of sea turtles. And they, they work there or have been working there to actually discover Kemp's Ridley sea turtle nests and, and they take the eggs and they bring them into an incubation center to make sure they can hatch as many as possible. And then they re- release the hatchlings back out into the Gulf of Mexico. A report came to light in July that too much money was being used by that operation there, that the um, the park staff should not worry about incubating eggs anymore, that they should just worry about um, identifying where the sea turtle nests are and um, put exclosures around them so people don't trample on them or drive over them with their ORVs, that they shouldn't worry about um, green and I believe loggerhead sea turtles, also endangered species, which also from time to time come to Padre Island and lay their nests there. Now, of course, you were the superintendent at Cape Hatteras National Seashore before retiring, and so you know a little bit about sea turtles and research. Does the coalition have any position on on what's transpiring at Padre Island as far as the sea turtle uh, recovery and science program? We haven't issued any kind of formal position. I certainly have a personal opinion about it, which you know probably <laughs> reflects is going to reflect the general concern that our executive council would have as well. As you said, I I worked at a sea turtle park. I studied the Padre Island sea turtle program pretty carefully as we were trying to figure out what to do at Hatteras. And in fact, uh, when I was there, uh, the assistant superintendent of the Outer Banks group left and the new assistant superintendent I hired had been the chief of resource management at Padre Island. a gentleman named Daryl Eccles, who'd worked there for a long time. So he really understood the, the Kemp's Ridley situation. There's some differences. My recollection is Kemp's Ridleys will nest during the day, right? whereas most of the other species of turtles that nest at Hatteras nest at night. So at Hatteras, since you know, we did the ORV rulemaking and um, prohibited off-road vehicles on the beach at night during the nesting season, the number of sea turtle nests has boomed incredibly. Mm-hmm. You know, that's probably the one best thing <laughs> that came out of the plan in terms of resource success. So prior to that going into effect, the park never had more than 100 sea turtle nests, and now they're averaging well over 200 a year. Wow. And it's hard to you know, you can't get in the turtle's mind, but if you think about it, if they're coming on shore at night to nest, there's a lot of lights and noise and commotion. They're less likely to come ashore there mm-hmm. than somewhere else. Uh, and another difference at Padre Island is the state of Texas considers drivable beaches as the equivalent of roads. Right. So the Park Service has less capability to, I think, seasonally restrict ORV access. So to me, their situation justifies and has long justified the incubate the hatchery program. So uh, turtle nests are laid during the day when there's a lot of people out there. Uh, they remove most of the eggs from most of the nests to a hatchery. Once they hatch, they release the hatchlings into the water. And it's been extremely successful. And the thing of it is, since Kemp's Ridleys are one of the most endangered sea turtle there is, it's an incredible conservation story how much Padre Island, this one location in the U.S., has contributed to progress toward recovery. Uh, They aren't recovered yet. They're not going to be delisted anytime soon. So in my, in my view, the decision to reduce the funding and back away from that program is extremely uh, short-sighted. It fails to take a look at the big picture of what the program has done and what still needs to be done. So I, I'm very disappointed in it, and I also have a lot of respect for 
uh, Dr. Shaver, who, you know, I've read a lot of information about her and seen her policies, and I, I know she's um, an all-star in, in the conservation, sea turtle conservation community. So she's very well respected, and so I just, I really don't understand why the Park Service is not supporting the program now. Yeah, I guess part of the concern was that a good deal of money, maybe upwards of a million dollars a year, um, was raised from outside sources um, through through grants and and whatnot. And um, there was a concern that you know that was an unsustainable revenue flow. And so that kind of begs the question of you know does the Park Service have enough money nationally to meet its science mission? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. Familiar with the revenue data, you know, my first thought is the fact that it's gotten a lot of external funding grants and whatnot is because it's been a very successful program. People don't keep funding something that doesn't produce results in the conservation community. So I guess my question is, has there been a diminishment of that funding? Has it become a problem or is it just sort of a a vague concern that hasn't happened yet, but being used as an excuse for reducing the funding. You know, I would say if all of a sudden the Park Service had to spend a million more a year because they aren't getting the outside funding, then yes, I could understand there's a reason to cut back. Yeah, it was interesting. On on one hand, they they noted that uh, Dr. Shaver's program has been able to attract this outside funding for for 20 years. Um, So that's a pretty good track record. And but they also pointed out that I guess some of the money was coming from uh, the Deepwater Horizon um, tragedy and and the money that the oil company was putting up to restore resources. And so that money, I guess, is supposed to be running out um, sometime within the next six years. Raising money can be hard to do, but it, it does seem rather extreme to uh, take such a successful program that has done such good work for, for Kemp's Ridley and, and scale it back um, so substantially. And what, to me, you know, I don't know how long discussions have been going on on this subject at, you know, at the park level, park service level. If they still have another five or six years of funding, then that seems like a lot of time to plan a transition to a lower funded program if that's what they believe is going to happen. But an abrupt change is, I think, devastating to the continuity of the program. You know, what I know about sea turtles is, you know, turtles that hatch at Hatteras, they go off (laughs) somewhere for five, six, seven years, and then they finally come back and nest again. So it's it's a long-term investment that has to be sustained. Mm -hmm. So it's not like at Hatteras you can say, oh, the numbers have doubled in the number of nests per year, so we no longer need night driving restrictions because that would just reverse the reason for the progress. So if the hatchery program at Padre Island is one of the primary reasons for their success, which I truly believe is the case, then to me it's critical to maintain it moving forward because it's the program won't the turtles need the help, and you know I'm a little familiar with what happens to Kemp's Ridleys in some of the uh, Central American and Caribbean countries where people poach the eggs, you know, view them as the delicacy and those kinds of things. So Padre mm-hmm. Island is really a shining star in the Kemp's Ridley recovery program. It's the most effective place on the planet, as far as I know, in terms of increasing the numbers of turtles. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Mike, there's uh, no shortage of topics to discuss um, from vandalism in the parks that we've seen to grizzly bear recovery at North Cascades ecosystem, Confederate statues in the national park system, and how to deal with those issues. Uh, unfortunately, our time is limited today, um, but I certainly appreciate you for joining us today and, and weighing in on some of the issues we could uh, discuss. Maybe we can join up in a another few weeks down the road and and delve into some of those other issues. Thanks for having me, Kurt. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we're going to delve into some of the technology involved in fighting wildfires in the parks. For instance, did you know that satellites help spot wildfires? 
For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.